how the industry works. Yeah, so some of the things we'll be covering will be about Java, the basics of the JVM, and the factor affecting the performance for the JVM. We'll also talk a little bit about the different types of JVM, and why IBM JVM is different than the other JVM that's around. And then, uh, how do you manage the JVM, different parameters that can affect your performance on the OS, and the performance options. So just a little background on myself. I've been on a mainframe, working on mainframe right from the beginning. I've been a database administrator. I was a systems programmer. <coughs> I was an application programmer. And then I worked in Java for many years. I was an enterprise architect at Bank of America. I did a lot of their strategic uh, initiative, emerging technology. I also did a lot of mainframe related work for them. And then uh, just a little brief about the company. We basically take a legacy program converted to Java, but we do it in such a way that you have to change nothing, no JCL changes or anything, and it runs as Java. And that's where I get a lot of my experience running on Java on Z and how to tune the performance, how to make it better. So I'll, I'll be talking some of my experience which I have learned over the years. So just a quick summary about Java. So Java started somewhere around 97, 98, and then um, they came up with version one. Actually, version one was really not a good version, I think, by the time they came to 97, they had a pretty stable release. And then IBM was not behind. They, at the moment, Sun at the time releases JVM, there was another JVM available on S390. And you can see, like, I went to IBM Gettysburg. I attended one of those early sessions on Java. I did my Sun certification somewhere around 98, 99. Started working on Java on on S390. So that was pretty exciting, uh, and I'll tell you why Java was so exciting in the beginning. In the next slide, I'm going to tell you. And the Java has come around with a lot of version. A version I skipped a lot of version in between. Version 5 is one of the ones in 2005, where there were auto boxing and there were other Java features, which were pretty useful. Most people these days are at Java 8. Java 13 is the latest version. I, Oracle has announced, obviously, Java was developed by Sun, and Oracle took over it, and they now recently announced that there's going to be a license implication of running their version of the Java. So they come up with a long-term support. Java 8 is a long-term support. That's what the LTS is. But IBM's J9 JVM, Eclipse, is an open source JVM, and IBM has a commitment to run it free and open. So you don't have to be dependent on Sun's JVMs. There are different licensing implications on the support model. So what is Java? So basically, Java, the promise of the Java is that you write once and you run it anywhere you want. It's very simple, and that's very powerful. So you take a Java program, you run it through a Java compiler, it creates a Java bytecode. And the Java bytecode is basically you can run on any machine you want. You can run it on Raspberry Pi, you can run it on your Mac, you can run it on Windows, <coughs> CoS, Linux, Unix, wherever you want it. It's completely platform independent, and that's why it's so powerful. What gets generated is a Java bytecode, they call it dot class file. And then you have something called a JVM, which is Java Virtual Machine, which is your execution engine. I would, um, from just from the analogy purpose, I would say it's something like a CICS, right? So it's it's an operating system where you can run Java inside. It's a virtual op virtual operating system for Java. So we'll talk more about JVM as we go down. You have few things. One is a JDK, which is a Java development kit, which provides you your compiler, which provides you your debugger. You also have a Java runtime environment, which is your execution environment. And on top of it, Java gives you a lot of monitoring facility, inbuilt monitoring facility. The debug facility is part of the JVM itself. That means it doesn't matter whether you, whether you run your JVM on Windows or you run on ZOS, it's going to behave the same. You can debug the same way, you can monitor the same way, you can run the same way. Everything is the same. From performance perspective, JVM requires memory, a lot of memory. And that's why you see the new version of JVM, especially 64-bit JVM. It's pretty attractive on ZOS because it runs about two gig line, so you have a lot more memory available. Rather than running a 32-bit, which was running two, below two gig line, putting a lot of pressure on the memory. And we'll talk about the memory area a little bit because it's very important from performance point of view. So there are different areas like method areas, <coughs> heap areas, stack areas, program counter registers, native method stacks. 
And then you have an execution engine. And the execution engine can run a native Java code. But people say, what about I want to run something that's very platform specific? And you can't run that in Java. So there is something called a native interfaces, Java native interfaces, J and I. So there are interfaces for native. You can run native libraries. You can write your own. I would highly recommend if you can avoid your writing your own J and I, avoid it. There are performance implications. For example, on ZOS, if you run Java native interfaces, write your own, it's about 11 instruction crossing over to go to GNI, 11 instruction back. It's quite a lot of performance over here. So if you can avoid it, there are two advantages. Number one, you can run Java anywhere if you don't use GNI. You're not stuck to the platform. And number two, you're gonna get a performance benefit. So I would always prefer if, if somebody asked me, say, avoid GNIs. So being an MBS person, I would like to take a little bit of analogy. It may not be an exactly right analogy, but I think it uh, conveys the point across of how the memories are used. So if you're an assembler programmer, what you do, you do a get main, you get an area, and then you work on the area, and then you free main when you're done with the area. What if your program starts doing get main and forgets to do free main, eventually you run out of memory. The early Java programmers, the people who wrote Java, they decided that they don't want to have a memory hassle. So Java has no pointers, no memories. If you're a programmer, you never do a memory management. There's no get mains, free mains, or pointer, um, pointer uh, management. Java does it for you. And that's important, because if you see the heap on the left side, heap is where Java keeps all the objects, and Java manages it for you, all the memory. So for example, if you write a re-entrant program, if you, let's say you write a re-entrant load module, what your load module does, it, the operating system loads up your load module, that's one memory, piece of memory, but your load module never modified itself. It does another get main, puts all your storage into the get main. So now, if you have five different transactions running, five different attached macros running, for example, I'm just doing an assembler analogy, each one has got a separate area. There's one load module, but you've got a multiple areas. So Java has something similar. Your method area, think of it as a re-entering load module. All your class files, all your static variables, they go into your method area. You can also call it a class area. They get loaded once, and then you have a heap size. Every thread, when Java needs an object, it puts it into the heap, and then Java manages it. Whenever it realizes that it doesn't need any more objects, it cleans it up. So there's a cleaning process. So it's equivalent of doing a get main and a free main. That's pretty important for performance. And then you have other areas like stack areas and you know, program counters, but heap is one of, the, one of the very important area in Java. So let's take a look at Sun's JVM, for example. So how Java manages this memory. So first thing when your transaction starts, your thread starts, Java puts all your object into something called Eden space, which is your first space. And as your program runs, eventually those objects are no longer needed. They are no longer referenced. Transaction ends. So some object might be referenced because the transaction may be a long running transaction or for whatever reason. What it does, it moves some of those objects from Eden sp space to survival space. That means those objects survived they're still being referenced. Somebody needs it, so Java cannot free them. But there are some objects which are empty. There are no references. There are no back references to them. So Java runs something called a minor garbage collection. And the garbage collector doesn't stop your process. Your, stop, your transaction will continue to run. There is no issues. The minor garbage collection cleans up anything that's not needed moves everything that's required into a survivor one space, a survivor zero space. By doing that, now you have a continuous memory. There is no memory fragmentation. And then over the period of time, the more thread comes in, more object gets created, and this thing keeps happening. It then moves the things that are not required, it cleans up, the things that are required moves into survivor one space. And then again, you have a continuous memory available. And this is happening in the background. It's happening as a separate thread. The way it runs on, OS, uh, on ZOS, it runs under a USS, Unix System Services. That's where your JVM is running. It, by the way, your JVM is zip eligible, which is another incentive of running Java on mainframe. It's 
100% zip eligible, provided you have enough zip CPU available there. If not, well, it might spill over to general purpose processor unless you want to disable that. So now your memory management is done through either survivor zero or survivor one. And over the period of time, it keeps a count of how many times this object has survived. And there's some threshold, 16, 24, I don't exactly know what IBM J9's threshold is, but since JVM might have a threshold of 60, you can manage it. And you can tell JVM that what's my threshold. When that happens, JVM says, I'm gonna move it into a tenure object. It's a long-term object. Your thread is running, it's been sitting out there, maybe a long running transaction that's sitting for the day, creating objects and objects and objects. And then some objects are not needed. The minor garbage collector cleans it up without any performance implication to your threads and transactions. But eventually what's gonna happen is your heap size is gonna blow up. Your old generation will not, the 10 year space will not have any more space. At once, once JVM realizes that you're getting close to hitting that memory limit, whatever that percentage is, a major garbage collector kicks in. That's important because when that guy kicks in, it does mark, finds out how many objects are used, how many are not used, sweeps, cleans them out, which is not used, and then compacts. That means it wants to avoid a memory fragmentation. When that happens, all the threads on the JVM stops. There's a pause. It's a fraction of microseconds of pause. Nonetheless, it's a pause. That's where you have a performance implication. So managing your garbage collector policy has a major impact on your performance, especially on a, you could be running a high transaction volume on JVM. You could be running long running <coughs> transactions on the JVM. Depending on the workload, there could be implications. So picking up the right garbage collector policy is pretty important. So that's one of the things we really want to focus on. So now let's take a look at the second part of the performance thing. What's important? So how you know when when I started with the Java and ZOS, the performance was really bad. I mean nobody would say it's good. The only reason you would run Java is because you're a Java enthusiast. You want to run Java. Everything changed after the EC12 processor came in on ZOS. That processor then there were a lot of hardware instructions were added onto, for just for Java. And the Torana lab on, um, yeah, IBM's Torana lab did a phenomenal job on making Java perform much better. IBM's J9, JVM, we're gonna talk a little, more, a little bit more about it. It actually does very diff things differently than Oracle's hotspot JVM does. And there are differences. On ZOS, it started to finally, you started to see the Java is really coming of age. And when I looked at the first Z12, EC12 processor, I said, yes, now I think I can really use it for a lot more things that I would like to use it for. And then over the period of time, there are a lot more hardware instruction added. And also there is a, something very important called a JIT compiler. And then that algorithm of the JIT compiler is phenomenally good. Oracle specification tells you that your Java bytecode, which is your interpreted code on the right, on the topmost, is what allows you to run your Java code on any platform. You can run it on Windows, Mac, Raspberry Pi, Unix, Linux. Doesn't matter, it's totally platform independent. But it's interpreted. So it's slow, you know, it can never meet up your COBOL performance, for example. Or uh, forget about a similar performance. But then JIT compiler kicks in, and JIT compiler is sitting silently in the background. An article says you cannot compile a Java code and keep a keep it for the platform. It's against you will not pass Oracle's JVM specification certification. IBM being a JVM vendor will not pass that certification. So that means they cannot take that interpreted code and compile it and save it. But what they can do as per the specification, they can compile it for the life of the JVM. Convert it to a S390 load module, or convert it to a C program, put it as a load module. So now it's a ZOS load module. And keep it as a machine code cache. The cache is important because once it's in the cache, instead of running an interpreted code, it runs your native ZOS load module. And that flies. That's where you're gonna see your Java code and COBOL code, the performance differences disappear. You're gonna see a real good performance. But the catch is, it's a cache. That means if you bring down your JVM, the cache is gone. Not only that, 
The cache is not available when your JVM comes up. So when you run your Java program, it runs interpreting. And the JIT compiler is sitting in the background and trying to figure out what are you doing. And it's very smart. It changes your bytecode. It re-optimizes it. For example, you might have a small, tiny method with 64 KB of code. Each one of them, JIT compiler says, I'm going to inline it. I'm going to expand this, make it like one single code. So you actually changes your code. JIT compiler changes your code and redoes it, and then recompiles it and put it as a machine code, and runs that machine code, and that's pretty efficient. You see a tremendous performance improvement by once the JIT starts kicking in. JIT is also watching things like how many times the method is used, and every JIT is different, depending on the JVM you use. And IBM's J9 JVM uses a different algorithm. It says, this particular method is cold, rarely used. This particular method is hard. It's been used quite a lot. This one is a scorching hard. It's used so many times. And your JIT compiler optimizes and optimizes and optimizes. It sits there. That's what it does. It is separate thread, a completely different thread from your processing. <coughs> so it doesn't affect your processing. But while your code is running, it swaps the code. Your interpreting code gets swapped with the load module. And it runs a machine code. It's a tremendous performance improvement. And that's what you need to see, that you want to have it. So what J9 JVM also does has something called AOT compiler, ahead of time compiler. Ahead of time compiler takes your Java interpreter code and compiles it into a machine code ahead of time. So you would think, why would you depend on JIT, right? Ahead of time compiler does the job. But trick is, ahead of time compiler, AOT compiler, only works if you use shared classes. So if you're running 10 JVM in your, uh, in your LPAR, you can enable shared classes. And AOT compiler will kick in, it will compile the code, and everybody can share the class files and the compiled code. So that's one way to do it. And that's very typical of IBM's J9 JVM. But AOT compiler never does as good a job as a JIT compiler would do. <coughs> JIT compiler is phenomenally good because it's actually getting an execution statistics. And looking at the way your transactions are executed, it's actually optimizing, which is pretty phenomenal. Yes. yes. Does it mean that all the shared classes are uh, compiled ahead of time? You can affect JVM's property. You can tell JVM what to compile and what not to compile. It's possible that you may say, my program keeps changing so many times. I have a release. I have an agile release. I don't want AOT to compile it. Versus I have system libraries where I want them to be compiled and they never change. IBM's JDBC driver, for example, for DB2 connectivity. That's not going to change. IBM is unless you want to change the driver. So you just want to load the bootstrap classes, things like that. And there is a performance, there is an X command. And towards the end of the presentation, I'll talk about those commands. You can influence what can be done in the ahead of time compiler and what cannot be done in the ahead of time compiler. You can tell JVM what to do and what not to do. And um, AOT compiler, uh, you can turn off the AOT compiler completely. And if you're running a single JVM, if you don't have a shared classes, there is no AOT compiler. Same thing with the JIT compiler. You can tell JIT, you can turn off JIT. I don't know why you would do it, but I'll tell you a real life scenario why I would do it in certain scenarios. You can put a JIT compiler to a particular level. You can put a JIT compiler to a particular class. You can tell how many times a method executed before compile. There are so many tweaking options there. But you will find the JIT compiler's default option is pretty good. It does a pretty good job. It's almost like a mind reader. So most of the time, you may not have to do too, much, too many changes to your JIT compiler. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so AOT compiler is doing, sorry? Optimization, that is correct. AOT compiler is doing optimization, but AOT compiler cannot do as good an optimization as a JIT compiler. And there is a huge difference. I, I have some rule of thumb statistics. I don't have a real numbers. AOT compiler is only 70% as good as a JIT compiler, maybe 60% as good. It's not as good as a JIT compiler. Any other questions so far? It's one or the other, I think. 
Is either IOC or GT count and GT, they don't provide the IOC separate code later on, right? You can do both. So you can have an AOT compiler for the shared classes, and when JIT comes in, JIT is going to replace it and put its own version of it. Is that a reasonable thought? Is that, is that practical or not? Yes, it is. Right. Yes, it is practical. So those are the most critical thing for a JVM's performance. One is heap management, and the second is your JIT compilers. These two, if you get it right, you're going to have your JVM fly. So the factor affecting JVM, just a recap, is a garbage collector. And I'm talking about Oracle's JVM here. It can run, the garbage collector can run serially. That means it's going to do one by one by one by one. It's a pause. Every time garbage collector runs, every thread in the JVM pauses. The second one is a parallel one. That means if you have a multi-core Linux machine, I'm talking a little bit outside ZOS, because I'm talking about Oracle's JVM. A parallel garbage collector can run on multiple CPU, multiple cores, and can parallelly do work. It reduces the pause. It only needs to pause your threads at the time of compacting. It can do all the marks, it can do a lot of things, sweeps, things like that. That is a high performance. There's also a concurrent one, where it, it can actually con run concurrently while your transactions are running, but then it's going to pause at the time of the delete. So there are different ways, and there are advantages and disadvantages. But we're going to discuss more about how ZOS does it, uh, and what garbage collector policy will affect the ZOS JV. So we'll skip that one. But nonetheless, the garbage collector is an important part, regardless whether you run Oracle's JVM or you run the IBM's JVM. The memory allocation, uh, you can impact how big is your heap sizes, because bigger the heap size, the garbage collector will take longer. Even if you're running 64-bit JVM, it's running about a two-bit line. You know, it, it could be a lot of heap size. Uh, Java loves memory, and more memory you give, better it performs. There's a permanent gen size, that's where your class files are stored. You can affect that, has a tiny impact. Code cache size is also important. So like I said, the JIT compiler compiles the code and puts it in a cache. And the size of the cache, you can tell how big of the size of the code cache you want. And if once the JIT compiler reaches, you know, JIT, you have thousands and thousands of classes running, Java classes running. JIT says, I cannot put everything into code cache. It's too much because I don't even have enough memory. It's going to swap out and it's going to put the most frequently used things into the cache. So the cache is an important part. Class sharing is an important class. Why? Because it brings down the JVM startup time. So if you have a class sharing enabled, and you have multiple JVM, and the JVM comes up, these classes are already shared. It doesn't have to load everything. So it, 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 your JVM comes up faster if you're running multiple JVMs. And then, of course, there is AOT and the JIT compiler. It looks at the profile characteristics. Inlining of the code, because calling a method in Java is an expensive process. But if you look at the Java's object-oriented uh, methodology and the principles, they recommend highly that you do getters and setters and methods. You never update your variable directly if you don't have to. It's good for maintenance. Maintaining your Java code is good if you have reusable methods. But those methods are expensive. So what JIT compiler does, first thing, it looks at the method that's a small methods. It inlines them, so they're no longer a method. And that's what I said, the Java is actually changing your code. Even if you have a code where you say variable one equal variable two, variable two equal variable three, and then you have some more calculation, JIT compiler might change the sequence in the way you have coded versus JIT compiler sees it. So there are a lot of optimization done as part of the JIT. And then on ZOS, uh, in the code cache side, you can tell ZOS to use by default 4K page, which is the default 4K page. You can have one megabyte page or you can have a two gigabyte page. So you can tell ZOS JVM to use two gigabyte pages. It almost reminds me of DB2 buffer pool sites. Right? So, it's a code cache over there. Question please. Yes. Uh, so, so all this discussion about parallelism, does it apply to a Java virtual machine running a single application or does it apply to a Java virtual machine running multiple applications like we do, for example, in, in Geeks? in CI 
ACIs? Yeah, I think you would like to run multiple applications on the JVM. Can you, can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, um, do you run multiple applications? Uh, sorry, I lost it, yeah. Can you repeat that one? Yeah, so, so I was asking. Yeah, let, me, let me read this one, I think it works. I was asking because I'm a little bit confused. Uh, if I, I, I run very simple Java programs uh, on my workstation, and of course there is a Java virtual machine running just my application. Right? So I was asking if the consideration he made about uh, parallelism, parallelism within the Java virtual machine applied to every uh, Java virtual machine implementation or if they are specific or if they are specific for uh, uh, poorer Java virtual machines like the ones we, for example, use in CICS. Yeah, so the, there are two types of parallelism. One is the JVM uses parallel threads for its own processing, like um, garbage collector, for example. So that's running in parallel. You also have things like um, JIT compiler, which is running in parallel. There are a lot of other processes that are running in parallel applies to every JVM. Now, within your program, Java is a multi-threaded language. That means you can create your own multi-threads. And that's completely application dependent. And then again, on ZOS, if you use SMD, you can use extra zip engines when you run Java multi-threaded. And there is an extra benefit. You're gonna see a performance benefit by enabling SMD on ZOS. So some of the parallelism will be helpful. So whether you run a single application or you run multiple applications, the characteristics of JVM, you're always going to get a garbage collector. You're always going to get a JIT compiler. But each JVM, you can influence how much heap size you want to have. Or you can turn off or turn on certain parameters. So let's go to the next one. And uh, what about the JVM? So you see, there are a lot of JVM popped up initially. There were Microsoft JVM. There JVM, JVM, there are a lot of JVM, they're not, they're not active anymore. The main JVM we have today is IBM's OpenJ9 JVM, and the name, name keeps changing. Sometimes it's called Eclipse J9 JVM, Eclipse Open J9 JVM, so I forgot which one is the latest one. I just call it, for simplicity sake, say J9 JVM, that's your IBM's JVM. That works across, it can work on Windows, it can work on Linux, it works on ZOS. There are slight differences in the some of the parameters that apply to ZOS, but pretty much it's the similar characteristics JVM, regardless of the platform you run it. Then you have Oracle's Hotspot JVM, which is one of the very popular JVM, came from Sun, it's Sun's JVM, Oracle acquired it. You also have Azure's Julu JVM, there were some copyright issue, I think IBM, Oracle filed a lawsuit against them, so I think that's settled. But they have their own version of it. You have Oracle's another Graal JVM, and there are some other JVM that are inactive right now. Now, the only differences that the JVM has, is supposed to have, is the way they do garbage collector, the way they do JIT compilers, things like that. Occasionally, you might find like a minor differences. We ran into issues like, um, especially the way the class being loaded in Oracle's JVM versus Sun's JVM. And if you're doing some, Java is supposed to be platform independent, but JVM independent, you write it once, run it anywhere. On rare occasion, I have faced situation where Oracle's JVM loaded the class in a different order than IBM's JVM. And that, that made slight differences if, if your, my program was dependent on the way the class are loaded. I mean, majority of the time, if you're writing business application, you're not gonna have an impact. So you really don't have to worry about, once you write your Java code, it's gonna work everywhere, seamlessly, unless you use a lot of GNI. And what, what, we, what I noticed on IBM's JVM is very memory efficient compared to Oracle's JVM. It, it, it's, it doesn't use a lot of memory. Oracle's JVM uses a lot more memory. Then you also have a shared classes available on GNI JVM, which is used for quick startup. AOD compiler for quick startup, that's are very typical for GNI. The JIT compiler on J9 uses completely different techniques than Oracle's JVM uses. And J9 JVM uses classification based on how many times a method is getting executed, like I said, whether it's cold, hot, scorching, or scorching hot, things like that. And then it decides how to optimize it. So the algorithms are very different. 
I don't know which one is better, but what I found on the ZOS <coughs> JIT, JIT compiler makes a phenomenal difference. It's one to 10. If I program that takes 10 seconds on interpreting mode, runs in one second. If I run it once, the JIT compiler kicks in. So it's even more, it's, it's, it's really good. The performance is really good on the JIT compiler. There are also differences in the garbage collection technique between the J9 and Oracle's JVM. And then one of the very important thing on ZOS is the JVM is supposed to be Unicode. It's meant to run on a different platform, but on ZOS we have an absolute code base. So this JVM is very smart JVM. On the edges, it converts things between ASCII and ASCII. So for example, if somebody is making a socket call, TCP IP socket call to your Java program, they're probably coming from a Linux platform and all those data is ASCII. But by the time they come to your IBM's J9 JVM on ZOS, your program will receive them in ASCII. So on the edges is doing the conversion. So for example, you write system.out.println, which is your basically writing a display in a COBOL equivalent. The, the J JVM will write it in ASCII. It's all ASCII based. But if you do a buffered reader or buffered writers, they are all ASCII based. So there are things where it decides I should use ASCII, and there are things where it decides I should use ASCII. So it's pretty phenomenal. So it's pretty seamless. And it doesn't matter if you compile your code on Windows, you can take the, not even the source code, take the byte code, run it on ZOS, it's gonna work exactly the way it worked on Windows. So that's one of the very good ones. And then there are page size consideration on ZOS, like 4K, one meg, one meg or two gig. And then um, a lot of hardware instruction added on a ZOS platform. So you see a major performance boost on on every release, Z13, Z14, you're gonna see the Java performance keeps getting better and better and better on every new new version of ZOS. So, uh, coming back to the parameter that affects JIT, there is a parameter, IBM, uh, Oracle, when they came up with, with parameters for affecting JVM, they came up with an X parameter. These are not standardized parameters. So that means when you start your JVM, you start with an X command, and those X or X dash X or dash XX commands are very specific to JVM. So the command that is used for Oracle will be different for use for J9. So for example, in IBM's JVM, if you want to enable or disable your JIT compiler, you type in X JIT, X no JIT, X int. X no JIT obviously says I don't want JIT compilers. You can disable it. Similarly, AOT compiler. If you use dash accent, I think it's duplicated. It's gonna disable your AOD compiler, it's gonna disable your JIT compiler. So now the question, uh, then there is also a parameter that can enforce the optimization level, saying that I'm not happy with the standard JIT compiler, but what I wanna do is I wanna tell JIT either to have no optimize or optimize cold, optimize warm, hot, very hot, scorching. And I can say scorching, the JIT compiler, <coughs> turns off the default JIT. Every Java class, every one of them, regardless whether they're important or not important, will get compiled. And they get optimized, let's say I use scorching. They get optimized to the max. And then you're gonna put it into the machine code, object cache. So you would think that's a good thing, but actually it may not always be a good thing. Firstly, it slows down your JVM. Because every time, every class that gets loaded has to be <coughs> optimized to the fullest, which may or may not be required. The second thing is, um, just because you did a scorching optimization doesn't mean you got any extra performance benefit. Sometimes you might just see your default uh, JIT optimization level is good enough. So uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a simple thing, so by default I think you can leave it the way the optimizer is do not use that uh, parameter <coughs> unless you have a good reason to use it. And then there is also, you can tell XJIT come. So you, when a method gets called in a Java program, called once, called twice, called thrice, the JIT compiler is keeping track of it. And JIT says, it's getting called too many times, let me optimize it. You can tell JIT, and you can say JIT count three. If my method is called three times, I don't care, compile it. So that's one way you're telling JIT that, uh, don't compile the methods that are only called once in a while, I don't bother, but if the method is called three times, compile it as 
OS390 load module. Run it as OS390 load, mo load module. It doesn't run as interpretive anymore. So things like that. What's interesting is you can actually see the decisions JIT is making. There is a command called exit verbose. You can tell whatever decision JIT is making, compile start, compile ending, or inlining, and JIT is going to dump out in a file every decision it's taking. So it's, if, if you're a geek like me, you want to go take a look at it. It's pretty interesting. What happened to this class? Why JIT made the decision to compile this versus not compile it? And how much optimization is done? The level of optimization it has done. So that's an example. And you can also do a quick start on the JVM. You can say, hey, JVM, just do a quick start. Don't bother about it because when JVM loads up, it has to do a lot of things as part of the load up. Slows things down. If you're in a hurry, if you're running lots of small, small jobs, you probably want to do a quick start. You also have another performance parameter called code cache and object heap size. And you can, I would say, go to one meg or two gig pages wherever possible if you can. The larger the page it is, better performance you get. You don't want 4K pages. They are just too small. You want bigger pages regardless of the heap size. So that, that's another parameter where it's pretty useful. You also have a parameter that are influencing the garbage collector. So by default, you have a Gen Con garbage collector policy. We have Gen Con policy, which is the second one listed. We start with the balanced one. So garbage collector basically marks every object. How many times the object, is it object being referenced? Somebody's calling this object. And any object that's not being used, it sweeps it, and then eventually it compacts it. So you don't have a memory fragmentation to avoid that fragmentation. So what it's doing in the balance policy is doing a concurrent mark, it's doing it parallelly. So your transactions are not starting, your bad jobs are not starting, it's stopping, sorry. Your transactions are not stopping. Only stopping at the time of uh, when it has to compact it. So it's a pretty balanced policy. It's usually used where, you know, you have, you have to see which one really works for you the type of transactions. The default is Gen Con, that's pretty, pretty good. It has a very short pauses. You won't even notice your transactions, and that works most of the time. I have also run a lot of bad jobs. We run a huge bad jobs, and those jobs run for four hours, five hours, things like that in Java. They're heavy duty bad jobs, doing a lot of DB2 processing, MQ processing, things like that. Those transactions, you may want to use, optimize for throughput as your GC policy, <coughs> where there are longer pauses, but it's a bad job. One microsecond or one nanosecond of pause is not going to hurt you but it overall increases your bad jobs performance. So that's some of the things you want to use it. And there is another policy called optimize for pause, which is somewhat similar to your optimize for throughput. You might have to play around and see which one works better for you. Then there is also, you can tell how many GC threads you want, parallel, if you want to do parallel GC threads. If you don't like the, what JVM is doing by default, you can influence it. You can tell JVM that I want 10 threads for GC, and there you go, you can specify as a parameter. So there are a lot of small tuning things that you can influence. You, you don't have to use it if everything works okay, but it's nice to know that there are options where you can influence the way your JVM works, so yes. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> have you got any experience with the pauseless GC on the Z14s? Have no. you used it at all? No, I haven't. Okay, I just noticed that I, there's a parameter, um, XGC concurrent scavenge. That if you have uh, the guaranteed storage facility enabled with a Z14 and ZOS version 2.3, it's pauseless GC, but you have to turn it on with that JVM option that I just displayed. I haven't played with it yet. I no, I haven't played it either, it. yeah. No, I haven't played it. Well, that's good, but it's going to yes. be better than it's going to be better than one thing. And especially, you yeah. well, you got you got to have some pauses, okay. but it's a lot less than probably a traditional. Right. Correct. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. No, I haven't played around with it. Yes. Has anyone in the room played around with it with Zeos Connect or anything like that? Or okay, I'll try it when I get back home. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that, that's a good one. I'm going to play around with it right now. I have. You don't have to yeah. So you said it's it's with two dot three. Yeah. It's with two dot three. Two dot three. Yeah. I'll give it a try, yeah. I haven't played around with it, but I played around with most of the parameters. 
that are listed here. Um, the shared classes, again, the shared classes is when you have multiple JVMs. Sometimes people just run bad jobs, and every bad job is a separate JVM. It's really up to you. I mean, I like to prefer a, to have a long-running JVM, but um, it's a preferences. The shared classes comes in very handy. You can also influence how the shared classes are, or what's the ma max adjust AOT size, whether you want to have a JIT data, and a class load of cache caching. You see that? There is a parameter called X share classes, boot class only. And when you do that, your application will not be ahead of time compiled. It's only the boot classes that need to compile. Things like MQ classes, JDBC classes, things that are that you don't want, you know, you don't change that often. But your application code has you have a release going on every few weeks. You don't want to be caching that. Let your compiler take care of it. And then you can also tell, you can actually store the JIT classes. And you can tell the directory where the JIT classes will be stored. This is a USS directory on ZOS. And then um, another important thing is, uh, how do you influence your heap size? So I have run Java programs, which are huge. And especially what we do is we take COBOL program or assembler program, we convert them to Java. They're not always uh, most efficient COBOL programs. The amount of memory they use is huge. So they do require a lot of heap size, and if you don't, the default heap size may not be sufficient. So there are two parameters. One is called XMS, S for the smallest heap size, because if I want to run a Java program that requires a lot of, lot of memory, and if there's not enough memory, it's gonna crash. So you want to say, I want to start my JVM with minimum one gig, for example. So you can say XMS one G. But then you can also tell the JVM that you never exceed more than four gig, for example, X, M, X. X means max and S means small. So those are the two parameters you can, that most likely you will use, especially if you're running large amount of JVM processing. Does it matter what garbage collection you're using, that your power decides when to increase? Because I've noticed that it increases after a garbage collection cycle. Yeah, actually it's the other way around. Your heap size, will influence which garbage collector you may want to use. Right. So if, if I use 12 gigabyte max heap size, I want to use a different garbage collector instead of right. using a no, general. My, my, I, I was just trying to figure out when does it decide to go from say one gig to 1.2 gig if the maximum is four. Because oh, the that, minimum? When you decide? Yeah, how does it decide to go from, because it doesn't jump from, from one gig to four. No, it doesn't, it doesn't. So, is, is that like an algorithm after the garbage collection happens, and is it, does it matter which garbage collection you're using on how it decides to go up? Yeah, I think that, that's a good question. So let me go back to the uh, original uh, slide here. So basically, every uh, non-running transaction, every object goes into the Eden space, they jump into the survivor one space, they jump into survivor, sorry, zero space, and then survivor one space. Eventually, this keeps marking and marking and marking. Now you have 24 generations. You have an object that's sitting out there. It's not going away. It's still being used. At that time, it puts it into a 10-year space. And then it's still there in the 10 year for a long time. So now your heap size keeps increasing. So more and more objects keeps coming into the 10 year. Let's say you said XMS is one gig. That's the minimum heap size it started with, whether you use it or not. And then from one gig onward, it crosses, it keeps going up and up and up and up. You can influence at what percentage you want garbage collector to kick in. By default, it's gonna to go to the 70%. It's gonna say, oh, I am on the 70% threshold. Let me run the GC. And I'll show you a demo, I think. So when you see the demo, it will become a lot more clearer how this heap size in a real life JVM, how the heap size are going up and down. But when I'm talking about the expansion. Yeah. So you're talking about how garbage collection no, but that expansion happens in this 10 year space. That means it, it, ne oh, okay. it never so took like, more than one gig. Uh, it never took more than it needs. Okay. But it can go, when it goes closer to four gig, that time the garbage collector will come back, sweep it, and it will go back to 512K, for example. So now your heap size is only 512. So in your chart, your memory usage goes up and up and up and up and drops. So did I allocate the whole four? That's what I'm trying to no, it doesn't out. allocate 4 gig. It okay. only uses what the minimum so, use. So I allocated 1 gig. Yes. And then at some point, 
it goes up. Yes. That's what I was trying to do. Correct. Correct. When the transaction starts using it, it may go up. Is there a recommendation about min and max? I know your mileage may vary on your own application, but yeah. you know, if you know it's going to be a big application, do you go ahead and say four gig and I usually run if you're running servers, Tomcat servers, I don't know if ZConnect uses any server or not. I would say keep it at least 512k the minimum, if possible one gig as a minimum. That's that's a reasonable. Way. If, if you're using 64k, uh, 64 bit, yes. JVM one gig is not that much of, that much of a problem. So keep is, that as a minimum. Is there is there a cost to going on and giving that next gig or whatever, or are you, or are you better just reallocating it? Ah, uh, that's a good one. So. The problem is if you don't pre pre-allocate, if you, by default, your JVM might come up with, let's say, 100 MB, but the moment you start your Tomcat server, it realizes it Pretty doesn't more. <laughs> need more. So that's the reason I think go with at least 512K. There is no cost. You can start with no X, XMS parameter. You can start with no minimum. Let JVM decide. But it's better to have some minimum based on your application process. Should I pre-allocate? Yeah, there, there is a parameter on the JVM X command, and if you use that parameter, it's not a default parameter, and I'll find out what exactly it is, but I've seen this happen. If you don't use that parameter, your application will not run if it yeah. needs more memory. But if you use that parameter, it will pick up and it will allocate the memory because it says, yeah, I have, I have enough. So if you specify XMX, it's, it's good that way. Okay. Have you used the garbage collection and an analysis tool on ZOS to... Yes, so I'll, let me show you a demo, I think. So, okay. it, because it's Java, it doesn't matter whether you use J, ZOS JVM or Windows JVM, you can use the same tool everywhere. So one of the tools I, I like to use is uh, Visual VM, and you can download it. It's a free open source. I downloaded one for Mac. Here's a Visual VM. So what Visual VM does is it can connect to my local Mac, a JVM running on, what happened? It's not showing anything? <laughs> Is there a, uh, I thought, did you switch screens? Mm, I switched from presentation to the demo. Okay, so just yeah, different window. Do I have to share that? 